You've got questions. We've got answers. We have the man to answer them. Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham Wealth Partners. Jeffrey, welcome back to another episode of Ask the Hammer. It's great to be with you as always, Bob. Great to have you. And I understand that your inbox is full of reader questions. It is. It's exploding this week. And uh, one of the questions I wanted to tackle here with you today was from Larry. And Larry asks us, uh, you know, Larry says, effectively, I'm 70 years old and I waited to max out my benefit. My wife is 68. She'll be 69 in February. And Larry started collecting his benefits last year in May of 2021. And he says his monthly benefit is about $3,600. His wife last year began collecting her spousal benefit of $1,200 a month. Their plan is when she reaches her 69th birthday, potentially to switch over for her to begin taking her own benefit of $2,700, which obviously is much more than the $1,200 she's receiving as a spouse. And Larry asks effectively like, hey, there's a lot of stuff going on here. Did we get this right? Um, And the answer, Bob, here is yes. And not only did they get it right, but they got it right as one of the last few people who could do what's known as a restricted application. This was something that was a major strategy that folks could use prior to the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. But in 2015, the changes made by that law expanded what are known as the deemed filing rules. What they said was for those who turned uh, full retirement age after, or for those who were born, I should say, after, on or after January 2nd, 1954, whenever you filed for your own benefit, you were automatically filing for your spouse's benefits. For those who were born on January 1st, 1954 or earlier, then you could still do what was called the restricted application, meaning file only for your spousal benefits. Say, only give me my spouse's benefits now and leave my own loan to continue to grow at that 8% delayed credit per year and then switch over a later date. And as it turns out, Larry's wife, if she's going to be 69 in February of this year, well, guess what? She would have been born in February 1953, one of the last few individuals who could use this very powerful restricted application strategy. So whether they knew it or not, they actually did right by themselves from a planning perspective. This sounds like a real win. Now, ultimately, whether they do right by themselves will depend upon how long both Larry and his wife uh, live. Certainly, if one of them passes away sooner, then uh, they should have taken both full benefits sooner, since only one benefit, the larger, will live on with the survivor. But assuming they both live for the foreseeable future, yeah, this seems like an absolute home run of a scenario, which, of course, leads to another question that gets asked. If I don't have the ability, right, I was born on or after January 2nd, 1954, what should I do? Like, how do I make my decision as to when to file for spousal benefits or not? And in short, it just pushes out the break even point, right? Because here, that restricted application almost gives uh, Larry's wife a a taste, if you will, of social security benefits, right? A a little amuse-bouche of benefits, so to speak, right? Uh, Just a little bit to nibble on right now while she waits for the bigger amount later on. But if you get nothing in the interim, well, obviously you're sacrificing more than if you could get a portion. So it has the effect of pushing out that break even point. In other words, how long do both spouses have to live in order to make this decision for both of them to delay receiving their own benefit, the right one? Most situations for married couples, the higher earner should probably delay. It's a lot less clear what the lower earning spouse should do. Really depends upon the longevity of both spouses. So to simplify things, Bob, one of the things I often suggest is the higher earner typically should focus on when the second death will occur, and the lower earner should often focus on when the first death will occur. If we think the second death will be long, doesn't matter when the first person dies, the higher earner should generally delay. Mm -hmm. And for the lower earner, it's a matter of do they think both spouses will live a long time? If they don't, if they think one of them may pass early, then that lower earner may want to claim sooner rather than later. Right. 
And, and of course, in the case of the higher earner, the longer they wait, the higher their survivor's benefit will be. Does that factor into your uh, equation at, at all? Exactly. That's why the, that, sur- that higher earner should focus on when the second death occurs, because that higher individual's benefit is the one that will live on with the survivor, right? If the higher earner is the survivor, well, they keep their own check and the other individual's check passes, you know, the, 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 the spouse who dies, their check kind of dies with them. Whereas if the higher earner is the one to die first, then the surviving spouse loses their own benefit and steps into the survivor benefit that was the higher earner. So either way, that bigger benefit lives on. And that is precisely why, to your point, why we generally emphasize a more, uh, a higher urgency to the higher earner to push their decision to delay relative to the lower earner. Doesn't mean the lower earner doesn't matter. It just means it's not as important in the grand scheme of longevity because that benefit will go away when, whenever the first spouse to die passes. Yeah. So I think you answered Larry's question and, and then some. Thanks. And that was a great question. And we'd love more questions. So if you've got a question, let Bob and I know. Give us a shout by emailing us at askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. Again, that's askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. And Bob and I look forward to seeing your questions in our inbox real soon.